Hello everyone, welcome to the class on Pharmacotherapy of Congestive Heart Failure. In the previous class, I have explained about pathophysiology of congestive heart failure. Heart failure, the primary reason for heart failure is ischemic heart disease. It may result in myocardial infarction which results in cardiac muscle death. That causes heart failure. When heart is failed, the ability of heart to pump the blood loses. It results in congestion of blood inside the heart. Hence, it is known as congestive heart failure. Now, this could be because of systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. In systolic dysfunction, the cardiac output reduces because heart cannot undergo systole. Diastolic dysfunction is majorly because of cardiac hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, here it is a pathological hypertrophy. It, it results in increased size of heart. Because of hypertrophy, heart loses the ability to relax and that is what is called as diastolic dysfunction. I have also explained about forward failure and backward failure. Forward failure means heart loses its ability to pump the blood in the forward direction. When it loses that ability, it is called forward failure. This results in congestion of blood inside the heart. When congestion of blood is there inside the heart, it also causes venous congestion. Veins will drain the blood, deoxygenated blood into the heart. But already when heart is congested with blood, veins could not drain their blood. Hence, it is known as backward failure. Now, after that, I have explained about left heart failure. Left heart failure results in pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema causes dyspnea and orthopnea. Whereas, right heart failure results in systemic edema or peripheral edema and ascites. Now, all these changes will result in adaptation in certain tissues like heart, kidney, vasculature and there also occurs neurohumeral changes. These neurohumeral changes are nothing but increase in sympathetic nervous system stimulation as well as renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system activation. All these conditions further aggravate heart failure condition. Now, in today's class, we will see the topics like cardiac remodeling, consequences of congestive heart failure, pharmacotherapy of congestive heart failure. In that, especially we will see into enotropic agents. Let us begin. Now, cardiac remodeling, we need to understand this term. Heart failure majorly results in cardiac remodeling. Cardiac remodeling means there is a change in shape, size, structure as well as function of heart. The heart size, shape, structure and function is altered and this again aggravates heart failure condition. So, these adaptations are bad, hence they are known as maladaptations. Maladaptation of heart which results in cardiac remodeling. Now, what happens in cardiac remodeling? Let us understand what happens in this cardiac remodeling. This cardiac remodeling majorly results in cardiac muscle hypertrophy. I have already explained in the previous class, this hypertrophy is a pathological hypertrophy. In this hypertrophy, capillary to myocyte ratio is reduced. That means, oxygen supply to muscle cell is reduced. If oxygen supply is reduced, it results in cell death. This cell death could be because of necrosis or due to apoptosis. Now, this cell death will the dead cell in the cardiac muscle are replaced by connective fibrotic tissue. The process is known as fibrosis. This is also known as scarring of heart. Now, this scar tissue or fibrotic tissue majorly made up of collagen. Now, this collagen do not have the ability to contract. Hence, it also results in errors in rhythm which is known as arrhythmia. So, all these changes are known as cardiac remodeling. Cardiac muscle hypertrophy results in cell death. Cell death will cause fibrosis and finally results in arrhythmia. Moving further, let us see the consequences of this congestive heart failure. The major thing with this is cardiac remodeling. This is what I have explained just now, cardiac remodeling. Now, with this cardiac remodeling, the major change that occurs to heart is heart loses its ability to contract or it, it aggravates heart failure condition. That results in reduced cardiac output. See, the major function of heart is to pump the blood, cardiac output. So, this cardiac output is reduced in congestive heart failure. When cardiac output is reduced, it results in reduction in BP 
as well as perfusion also reduces perfusion means the blood circulation to a particular tissue now reduction in bpp perfusion decreased perfusion will activate sympathetic nervous system as well as renin angiotensin aldosterone system both of them will get activated now what happens with the activation of this one sympathetic nervous system activation results in increased cardiac contractility increased cardiac contractility also known as inotropic effect as well as increased heart rate known as chronotropic effect the effect of both the factors is to increase cardiac output it is trying to re-establish cardiac output now again renin angiotensin aldosterone activation results in severe vasoconstriction constriction vasoconstriction angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor so it results in severe vasoconstriction this severe vasoconstriction also results in preload and afterload increase now preload afterload increase is very detrimental to cardiac health this is what causes major mortality so briefly these are all the consequences of congestive heart failure now out of this the major goal of treatment should be we need to reduce cardiac remodeling increase cardiac output and reduce preload and <coughs> excuse me afterload so these are all the ma major pharmacotherapeutic therapeutic goal now let us see a little details about this preload and afterload look at this see i have already explained preload preload is pressure from volume of blood in ventricles at the end of diastole that means all the veins drain their blood into right atria from right atria it falls down to right ventricle now all this is venous return when this venous return is increased congestion of this ventricle results in increased pressure on ventricular wall so this increases ventricular wall tension this sustained ventricular wall tension will cause cardiac muscle damage whereas after load afterload is related to this resistance left ventricle must overcome to circulate blood let us understand this this one is iota see this left atria gets blood from lungs this is oxygenated blood from this atria it falls down to ventricle from this ventricle the blood must be pumped to this iota from this iota all this oxygenated blood is supplied to body parts now the pressure in this iota will determine the health of this left ventricle that means if if here the pressure is high if in iota if pressure is high this ventricle must contract vigorously so as to pump the blood into this iota so this is what is this so if if the pressure is high in iota that increases pressure on this left ventricular wall and this increases cardiac workload so this is what happens increasing afterload increases cardiac workload so these two preload and afterload increases is increases mortality to cardiac muscle moving further so in pharmacotherapy involves the four major classes first goal is to reduce preload how preload can be reduced by using diuretics angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers and venodilators understand this one see preload is related to venous return if you dilate these veins the venous drain will reduce if it is reduced means preload is reducing so venodilators acts to reduce preload next class next class is about afterload reducing afterload is reduced by angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers and arteriodilators look at this see this afterload is related to arteries if you dilate arteries what happens if you dilate arteries if here the iotal pressure reduces if iotal pressure is reduced the workload on this left ventricle reduces you are saving left ventricular muscle walls that is what happens with this now the next goal is to increase contractility what happens in in congestive heart failure cardiac output is reduced you need to increase this cardiac output so that perfusion increases for this the drugs used are enotropic agents enotropes or enotropic agents digoxin a cardiac glycoside beta agonist and pde3 inhibitors are used now the final one is the final goal is to reduce or delay remodeling of cardiac muscle this can be achieved by angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers pyrrolactone and using beta blockers we'll see every class in detail but in today's class we'll see about enotropic agents now before getting into that let us understand the frank starling mechanism of heart what happens with this see the cardiac efficiency is determined by stroke volume stroke volume is the volume of blood comes out of a heart 
per stroke in a healthy heart it is around 70 ml it means with one contraction 70 ml of blood gets into aorta in normal heart look at this this is in y axis in x axis you have ventricular filling pressure that means the amount of blood inside the ventricle will determine this look at this one this is the normal graph that means by increasing this ventricular pressure look at the look at this line by increasing this pressure stroke volume is rising rapidly this is what happens in normal heart whereas in case of congestive heart failure this is what happens see look at this these are all congestive symptoms low output symptoms in congestive heart failure see the red line even though the pressure is increasing there is no rise in stroke volume that is what results in decreased cardiac output now how can you treat this to treat this certain agents are used look at this this d indicates diuretics when at this junction when you use a diuretic what happens with diuretics diuretics will increase urinary output that means they will reduce congestion so the pressure is reduced why pressure is getting reduced because you are reducing congestion but they will not increase stroke volume whereas using enotropic agents or vasodilators will cause increase in stroke volume the combination will will move the condition to at this junction so understand the importance of these three agents diuretics enodilators and vasodilators next now enotropic agent we have three major classes are there cardiac glycosides example is digoxin beta agonist example is dopamine dobutamine whereas pde3 inhibitors milrinone enoximol out of these three agents cardiac glycosides are majorly used to treat chronic congestive heart failure but not these other two the reason why the other two are not used is both these agents will increase oxygen demand when oxygen demand is increased it may results in ischemic injury and further aggravates heart failure in fact they these two agents will increase mortality of congestive heart failure so they are not used whereas cardiac glycosides though they cause increase in contraction they have an indirect action which will not increase oxygen demand that much we'll see in detail before that we'll see the mechanism of action all these three agents acts in a similar way all the three agents will increase intracellular calcium levels in intracellular calcium levels in cardiac myocyte how let us see with this with the help of this diagram now before getting into that let us understand the details what happens in myocyte now see myocytes has got this l type of calcium channel during action uh, action potential sodium calcium gets into the cardiac cell cardiac calcium gets into the cell through this l type calcium channel so calcium get inside once calcium is inside it act on the rhinodyne receptor this rhinodyne receptor is present on this sarcoplasmic reticulum remember sarcoplasmic reticulum will stores calcium inside it so all the calcium 70% of the cellular calcium is stored back in sarcoplasmic reticulum so sarcoplasmic reticulum contains this rhinodyne receptor when these are activated by calcium they release calcium amount look at this the released calcium will be acting on troponin c and that activates myofilaments and finally causes contraction so this is these are all the events that happens during action potential now after this once the contraction is done calcium is again taken back into sarcoplasmic reticulum with the help of a calcium atps sercs indicates sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium atps the job is to take back this calcium inside this sarcoplasmic reticulum 70% will be taken by taken back into sarcoplasmic reticulum remaining 30% is taken out of the cell by either calcium atps or by a pump called as sodium sodium calcium exchanger the job of the sodium calcium exchanger is it pumps out a calcium ion out of this cell and takes back three sodium into the cell that is why it is known as exchanger it exchanges calcium with three sodium now this sodium gradient is maintained by sodium potassium pump whatever the sodium gets inside the cardiac cell here that is again taken back outside the cell by taking two potassium into the cell this is sodium potassium pump sodium potassium pump has got a mnemonic n o k i a nokia n stands for sodium that means sodium goes out o stands for out whereas k stands for potassium i stands for potassium comes inside by using atp in fact this happens with 3 to 1 that means 3 sodium goes out 2 potassium comes in and using 1 atp so this is what is the normal physiology let us see what is the effect of all these drugs 
Now, three agents will be acting on this mechanisms: catecholamines, beta agonists, PD3 inhibitors, and then cardiac glycosides. Let us understand about cardiac glycosides. Now, cardiac glycosides inhibit CRC, inhibit sodium potassium pump. Now, once sodium potassium pump is inhibited, the sodium gradient is not maintained inside the cardiac cell. If this gradient is not maintained, the sodium calcium exchanger could not work. What is the job of sodium calcium exchanger? It will send calcium out of the cell. If this is not working, what happens? Calcium levels inside the cell increases. If calcium levels are increased, what happens? It acts on myofilaments, increases cardiac contraction. Increasing cardiac contraction is nothing but enotropic action. This is how cardiac glycosides act. Simply they will inhibit sodium potassium pump that reduces sodium gradient, inhibits sodium calcium exchanger, increases calcium levels and causes enotropic action. Clear? Now let us move on to the other two agents. Catecholamines and phosphodiesterase inhibitors both of them will increase the cyclic AMP levels. See the beta receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. The type is GS type. When catecholamines bind with this receptor adenyl cyclase is activated and from ATP cyclic AMP is synthesized. Now cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. The job of protein kinase A is it is a kinase that means it attaches a phosphate group. It attaches that phosphate group to L type calcium channel that opens calcium channel and calcium gets inside the cell. Again protein kinase A also phosphorylates rhinodine receptor which releases calcium into the cell. Again, this protein kinase also acts as an inhibitor protein of troponin which converts into troponin to active form and causes contraction. You can see the multiple effects of protein kinase A. So by increasing cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A which increases the levels of calcium inside myocyte causes contraction. Phosphodiesterase is, is an enzyme, phosphodiesterase 3 is an enzyme which can metabolize cyclic AMP to 5 AMP. If you inhibit that enzyme, what happens? You are increasing the levels of cyclic AMP. So both the classes will act through cyclic AMP and increase calcium levels. Moving further, now cardiac glycosides as I explained you, cardiac glycosides majorly used to treat chronic congestive heart failure. The other two classes are not used because they increase oxygen demand. Now why cardiac glycosides are not increasing oxygen demand that much? The reason is they cause baroreceptor reflex along with that they stimulate vagus nerve. Vagus nerve stimulation has got two effects. One, it inhibits sympathetic nervous stimulation. Two, it activates parasympathetic nervous stimulation. This reduces heart rate. When heart rate is reduced, oxygen demand is reduced. So cardiac glycosides are causing increasing cardiac output with less oxygen demand. Hence they are used in chronic congestive heart failure. They also causes this frequency control is because of reducing heart rate. But cardioglycosides has got multiple adverse effects. It has got low therapeutic in index. Uh, it's around 2. Therapeutic index is, is nothing but a ratio between lethal dose by effective dose. So you, you in a doubling dose will cause lethal effects. That is dangerous. Now, because they are increasing high levels of calcium, it causes re-entry arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation and extrasystole. So it is a kind of pro-arrhythmogenic. It also causes visual halos, nausea and diarrhea is also major side effects of cardiac glycosides. Thank you for watching this video. In next class, I am going to explain about remaining pharmacotherapy of congestive heart failure.